This is Boomer Life on CL 650. And I'm your host for this edition, Peter Shad. Uh, are you where you want to be financially? That's our theme today. A well-thought-out plan for your financial future is an integral part of building the life you want for yourself and your family and helping us with those issues. Jim Doyle, Senior Financial Consultant with Investors Group Financial Services, Inc. And Carmen Ruiz Ilata. Perfecto. I nailed it. I nailed it. Uh, We've been uh, talking about a very taboo subject, helping aging parents with the next chapter of their lives and the final chapter. And before we get to the stage, we often do something that seems simple on the surface, Jim, but can create a lot of unintended problems. Let's talk about the pros and cons of joint ownership. You know, it starts out innocently enough. And it's not uncommon for couples, you know, to merge their bank accounts, especially if their incomes are somewhat similar. And they might merge their uh, uh, paychecks, depositing them to one bank account and pay bills and retirement and investments from it and so forth. And they might even own a joint credit card and possibly uh, a home jointly. And that's where the problems can start. Now, we take this for a couple to say where they have their first child, okay? And one of them takes time off to, to raise a child. Or, or maybe they're taking care of elderly parents or, or something else. And they're not earning the income. It changes the priorities in terms of their money. Do people in first marriages uh, generally tend to merge their finances? Or is this uh, something all couples need to talk about? Well, I'd love them to talk about it. But I'm not sure that there's a right or a wrong when it comes to deciding if a couple should have a joint account. It comes down to preferences and, and money management styles. However, if you and your partner have sizable differences in your money management styles, then maybe separate accounts could be the right answer. Now, what about the second marriages when the couples have children from previous marriages? This is one area that we see a lot of separate accounts, bank accounts, investments, and properties. Often, one of the partners cites ease or maintaining independence as their main reasons for doing so. And if there are substantial resources, or if you want to treat the kids uh, from the first marriage differently from the kids of, say, the second marriage, you want to speak with your legal advisors about your options here. Fair to say, Jim, that a lot of families are just kind of hoping their kids will work it all out? I think a lot of families are confused when it comes to sorting out matters that pertain to family law, wills, and the states. These, these bits of legislation, they don't play nice together. And it's not uncommon for families not to talk about their estate wishes or explain the reasoning for their wishes. And this can often leave unpleasant legacies for the beneficiaries. Well, here's where you combine a number of your professional designations to really bring value to your clients. And it sets you apart. Your CFP and your TEP, that's a a registered trust and estate practitioner. And your CDFA, Certified Divorce Financial Analyst. You mentioned that differences in family law and estate law could create problems. Do you have any examples? Well, I always want to make sure that you're talking with your legal advisors and your tax people before implementing anything that involves your assets, wills, or marital issues. So when I talk about the family home as an example, it's a pretty interesting item. You know, you might want to pass it on to one of your adult children, but a surviving spouse may have rights to the home even though they were never on title. What about pre-principal residence exemption, which came into existence last year? You know, this is something I think we're going to hear a lot more of in the future, and it's only just started. And I can see there's going to be a challenge for a lot of families, especially those who have joint ownership of a principal residence with their kids. What is it and why will it matter to our listeners here? Going forward, when you sell your principal residence, a tax filing is going to be required. And it's of particular importance if you fall into one of these categories. If there's a death, if there's non-residents involved, if there's a separation or divorce, and of course, don't forget, trusts. Can you give us an idea of how we're affected there? Most people can remember how much they paid for their home, but if you rented your home out in the past and later moved back in, or you own a laneway home, that one's huge, okay, or you've added someone other than your spouse to the title, like your kids, your tax and estate planning probably just got a whole lot more complicated. (laughs) How so? Well, let's take a look at an example, okay? Do you know the value of the property when you added your kids onto title, and do you have supporting paperwork? 
the principal residence exemption would be looking for those details when you sell your principal residence. Now imagine it's your executor who's left to find out these details. How will this process go for them? And I'd love to talk more about this if, if we only had more time. No, I'd love to hear a lot more about it as well. You're raising a great point, and here's why you need to work with a financial planner who does estate planning. And, and getting back to some of the pros and cons about joint accounts, Jim, we know that RRSPs and TFSAs, tax-free savings accounts, cannot be jointly held. But some people like the idea of joint accounts for their non-registered investments. Why is that? One that we hear over and over again is avoiding probate. Jointly holding non-registered investments can ease an administration on death and easily pass on to a surviving spouse. But it's not so simple um, when you have children on the account. Imagine a 70-year-old couple with two adult children. They have a joint non-registered investment. Let's say the market's worth about 750000 Their investments have done well. They originally invested 400000 They're considering adding their kids to the account to avoid probate when they pass on. Which I'm sure is not an uncommon situation. Yeah. You know, in B.C., uh, probate on this amount might be around 10500 But by adding their two kids to the joint account, they would trigger about $175,000 in capital gains on the account, resulting in a tax bill of around $70,000. <sighs> wow. Whoa. <laughs> Now, just imagine this couple had instead decided to add their adult kids onto the title of their family home, say about five years ago, like we spoke of earlier. At that time, the home was probably worth about one and a half million. Today, maybe it's worth about three million. And they're looking at the, uh, avoiding future probate costs. Now, on a million and a half bucks, that'd be around 21000 in savings. If in this example, we lost mom and dad, two items often come up. Do either of the kids wish to own mom and dad's home? And if so, where are they going to get the money to pay out their sibling? And what are the capital gains tax issues on this property? Now, mom and dad are entitled to the principal residence exemption for their portion of the home ownership, but the kids' portion may be subject to capital gains tax, okay, of about $161,000 apiece. So we went from trying to save $21,000... And now it'll cost them about $332,000. Yikes. That sounds like a good deal, right? <laughs> okay. Um, and these are not uncommon issues we're often asked to look into. In fact, you know, we're often approached for strategies on how to undo some of the stuff that they've already done. Are there any issues to be aware of when setting up joint accounts? Well, I think there's several of them. Okay. And we often uh, see setting up a joint account as well-intentioned, but they often come with future issues. But what about a grandparent that's looking to set up a joint account, say, with a favorite uh, grandchild? You certainly want to be careful how you set these accounts up. Canada Revenue Agency has a portion of the Tax Act that addresses something called attribution. Simply put, it means the earnings are taxed in the account holder's name, but it also attributes the income back to the original contributor. It applies to spouses, minor children, grandparents, aunts and uncles. And it's worst, you know, this can be a form of double taxation. So if I'm in a household where, say, one spouse has most of the investments and probably carries most of the tax burden, you're saying you probably shouldn't transfer assets to the other spouse's name so they could pay tax at the lower rate. Is, is there anything you could look at doing instead? Well, I have a number of solutions, and, and some of them we're going to touch here for a moment if we could. Okay? I'd like to suggest that it's important to talk with your advisors, your tax people, before implementing anything that we're talking about here. Which is great advice because obviously there might be other elements that need to be part of the decision process. But let's talk about option one. Okay. Well, you could systematically transfer investment income from a non-registered investment as it is earned into the hands of the lower tax spouse. It's a little easier for us to do using mutual funds because you don't have to worry about tracking multiple dividend or interest payments. Now, by transferring the income to the other spouse, any compound growth it generates will not attribute or be taxable in the original spouse's hands. Jim, you talked about two options. What's another option that you wanted to share? Income splitting. And I could probably do a whole show on that. But you know what? I really want to bring Paige into this. Your associate, Paige Brettel. Well, you guys are building a lot of value in your practice, whether that's new relationships or providing services to your existing clients, finding people getting excited about their financial future. 
Paige, what's your biggest takeaway from these last five years working with Jim? Hi, Peter. It's Hello. great to be here. Um, I would say that my biggest takeaway has been that I want to be able to help people on their financial and their investing journeys because I, I understand firsthand what can happen when we don't get the right advice and not to mention if we don't follow the right advice, you know, you have to be open to the message. Um, I'd say my biggest takeaway would really have to be, you know, start saving now. The earlier you get started, the better. But as Carmen mentioned earlier in the show, it's never too late to get started. So I have to ask you, Paige, there's a lot of stereotypes when it comes to millennials and their money. As a millennial yourself, the instant gratification society, uh, are those assumptions accurate? Well, Peter, <clears throat> I like to think the stereotypes uh, like cliches exist for a reason. Yes, millennials do love their avocado toast, okay? <laughs> Me too. I said it. <laughs> um, but who doesn't love avocado toast? Uh, it became popular for a reason. And I agree with you. It's excellent. I think I've even seen Jim eating <laughs> avocado toast. So. Maybe. <laughs> um, you know, there's something I like to refer to as the latte factor. And that's, you know, do we factor our everyday luxuries like our morning coffee into our budgets? Considering the most of it, I think most of our budgets are probably quite elastic. Um, we probably do, and we probably don't feel bad about it because we deserve it. We got up today, right? We got out of bed, and that deserves a little something, something. Amen. <laughs> you know, and I, I have to say, though, that I think most of us are engaged in that habituated spending without realizing it. You know, how often, and I'm going to give you an example here, how often do you go to the grocery store and you have items in mind, you might even have a list, and then there's sale items and you have to stock up on them. Do you need those items? Do you need five of those items? <laughs> you probably don't, but we think we're being prudent in the moment. But ultimately, you know, I have to say the impulse spending, whether at the grocery store, whether at the coffee shop, it hurts our ability to save for our bigger goals. Impulse spending at the grocery store. That's never happened to me. Key lime pie ice cream only comes out once a year. You need five. <laughs> um, at the risk of offending an entire generation, you know, I'm, I'm saying it's still a hard lesson for me to learn. But if you're buying the coffee every day or you're ordering out for lunch or dinner and it's not the occasional treat, that behavior will hurt you over the long term, you know? And for some, piece, uh, for some reason, I think that people tend to consistently underestimate the power of a bunch of small numbers. Like spending anything under the threshold of $10 somehow doesn't count. But imagine how quickly $10 could add up to become something awesome like a trip to Europe. $10 a day becoming a trip to Europe. You guys, it's been uh, absolutely fabulous chatting with you. Uh, Carmen, really nice to meet you. And we'll certainly uh, hopefully have you on the show again. Uh, it's always great to be here. Jim, insightful, important stuff. And I think the key for you listening is to contact Jim and talk to his team, including Paige, who represents the Millennials, 604-682-5431. Or you can email Jim, jim.doyle at investorsgroup.com. This has been Boomer Life on CL650.